the presentation today is about one of our products and uh, it's uh, the product that we essentially opened to beta yesterday and uh, we'll be doing a short demo talking about why we like why we did it and uh, we'll have Q&A in the end so just a few things about me so I've been in the IT for like around 10 years and I primarily I started with software engineering and uh, like I've done DevOps, cloud, project management, so everything around that across multiple industries. And uh, recently I founded LS DevOps, which is primarily focused on like what we call building elite DevOps. And what we mean by that, we essentially do courses as well as provide tools to simplify your SDLC. You can visit the website to learn a bit more about that. And um, let's jump straight into today's topic, which is the code reviews, right? According to Atlassian and GitLab, code review is primarily about learning and getting new skills. Then it's about like collaboration and then like unveiling bugs. So the heart of it all is learning, right? And why, why is it important? And especially if we think about it from the DevOps and cloud perspective, we historically were always more focused on the application code review than anything else. And it's understandable because if it's a giant code base, you really want to understand it all and you want to, as many people as possible to understand it. So uh, Alex, could you uh, put the slides into uh, slideshow? They'll make it a little bit bigger uh, oh, let's for everybody see. to see. How about now? Yeah, that looks, looks okay. great. Amazing. So, yeah, the, the, idea, the idea is to make sure that um, like typically, like you use code review for, an, for the learning purposes of the large code base, especially in the application development world. And like, if you have thousands of files, if you have even hundreds of files right, in half a year, you don't remember like 90% of it. So continuation of the code review process is essential. But what we found out throughout the years, which is changing now, but there is like quite a lot of room to grow, there was not that much of attention to the DevOps stuff, meaning like your infrastructure as code, Docker, like containers in general, CI, CD. So it was kind of like, its own world for, for a long while. And only recently people really started to pay attention and thinking long-term in terms of how they design CI, CD, how they design their Terraform, how they um, work with Docker. And um, there is quite a lot of things that could be done to improve that. So. The really the downside for like such code reviews, they take a long time. And uh, the more like the more you need to review, the larger the chance that you won't remember a thing. And uh, this is kind of really like you want to review as much code as possible without forgetting as with most of it, really. So that's uh, that's kind of a fine line. And um, we really want to make sure during the code reviews that uh, we kind of try to keep near that line and be productive. So again, in the in the heart of this of all of this is knowledge sharing. Also, you can arguably think about security, which is mostly provided by like tools like TFSec, Checkoff, or like Sonar Cloud, Snake among others. Um, it's also about collaboration, so you share what you do. Right? And again, uh, ultimately, this has to increase the code quality. So um, there is a ton of infrastructure code, right? If you want to create like multiple environments, if you want to design your cloud fully through, uh, through infrastructure as code, if you have fully containerized environments, there is a ton of code ton of DevOps specific code. So 
there will be quite a lot of automation and uh, like involved into some housekeeping. And uh, it provides some quick reviews, like let's say uh, TFSEC, right? It does quite a lot of things. So yeah, uh, Alex has uh, yep. got a note from Martin. Maybe the sound is, is bad. Is there one way to oh. uh, um, speak up? What about, like, what, about, uh, what about now? Now is it like, should be better? I think I, like, I can. Uh, yeah, just uh, keep the uh, closer. Yeah, if you keep the, the microphone closer, people are saying okay. it sounds better. Yeah, okay. thank you. Amazing. Um, yeah, so the upside of the automation, of course, is that you have quicker reviews and you have like you don't really pay attention to things like, let's say you selected the wrong instance type, or you forgot to enable some, uh, like you forgot to make your buckets private. So things like that are being reviewed automatically right now by like many many tools, and that's amazing because you don't really have to pay that much attention to it. Really, the drawbacks are that you have to configure them, right? So they run on your CI, they take time to run, and uh, really, you still have to look through the code to make sure that it's readable. And that's where th what the code review is about, right? It's about readability. It's about like making sure that you do not forget things like, after half a year, and you can quickly go through the code and understand what's going on. So. Um, there are a ton of tools, as I said, like TFWind, TFSEC, Sonar Cloud, Chekhov. They're, I mean, they're, they're all amazing and they cover their own areas. One of the things that no one really covers that much in the DevOps world is readability. And that's kind of what we think ultimately affects cold quality. We write code for it, like for firstly for it to work properly, and secondly so others can understand it and maintain in the long run. And uh, since there there's been quite a lot of DevOps projects, and uh, everyone uh, everyone adopts the practices, and it's um, everyone starts thinking about long term and what's uh, the code going to look like in seven years, which is. Um, which is essentially a new thing. So code quality becomes essential. So in order to achieve, like in order to address that code quality problem, really, we developed a GitHub app, which is something you install through GitHub and you select the repository where you want it to be installed. You can select as many repositories as you want. And um, one of the things that we also want to address is that it doesn't really need to require any settings. So you just select the repositories you want it to be in, and that's about it. And we are really focused on code quality and best practices. We're not checking like whether you selected the right instance type to replace your TF wind, or like whether you um, made your buckets private to replace like TFSEC and Sonar Cloud and what others do from the security perspective. We want it to be like sort of a code body or teammate that does a really fast review for you. So whenever you raise a pull request, you have almost immediate feedback. So you can review this with your team and gain more knowledge about your code base and ultimately see what could be improved. One important thing really before the demo is um, we don't like act as let's say uh, as a stopgate for uh, for your CI or for your pull requests. We are there to make a review like to check your code against certain best practices, and uh, then like it's up to you and your reviewer essentially to decide if you want to proceed without them or you have to incorporate them. So that's. Um, that you seamlessly integrate into your existing repositories as well as the new repositories. So now let's do a short demo. Let's see. Okay, 
So we have a repository called microservices demo. Jim, you were saying something? Yeah. Uh, could you just uh, speak up a little bit? On, oh, um, uh, okay. Yeah, just okay, want to yeah. go through the demo. Keep it nice and loud. I don't know if it's something with the microphone, but it's... Um, let it's me, let me actually do something. Uh, so that should make things better. Might be like I switched the microphone. So that should help. All right. Yeah, let's, uh, let's give it a shot. Okay. Yeah, yeah, perfect. So... Um, on, on the screen right now, you can see the microser microservices demo repository. It's one of the go-to repositories from Google for um, demo purposes. It has some Terraform in it. It has like a bunch of things. So that's that's really that's a really nice representation of what the typical project would look like. So um, let's start with, for example. So we, we have we have this repository. It's in my code space. Uh, um, Alex, before you get too deep, can you make it a little bit bigger? Well, if possible see. to yeah. something something like that. That somehow made it smaller. Oh, okay. Let's see. All right. Yep. That should do the thing. Yeah. That, okay. yeah. Thank you. Yep. Yep. Perfect. So it has really nice um like it has a few resources right so it's like it creates a, G, a gke cluster it enables some apis um, deploys uh, a test application and uh, also it creates a database uh, based on the flag it also has a few outputs um, and uh, like a few common variables so from the Automation perspective, it has a validation uh, for your Terraform. So let's just do let's just do a thing and uh, let's try let's try and actually add a few more things here. So um, it does very basic Terraform validate, which is obviously not enough for um, for the security review, even for some of the linting that uh, that you could do. So, really, let's let's see how we can elevate that. And one of the first things that you could do that you can incorporate in your workflow is a product called tflint, which is going to do a linting of your code. So. I think it's yeah, it should be before. So we'll also run in it, and we want our results to be published into GitHub annotations, and we're going to talk about them in a bit. So that should just download a few things, and uh, then we need to run the actual tflint. So yeah, so that's uh, that will do the the basic thing, and um, in a, like to make it a bit more sort of. Google Cloud specific, I would say, um, we we need to add Google Cloud plugins. So it's tflint hcl. That's um, that should be the thing. So it will be like something like that. So it will it will download Google specific linters, Google specific rules. So you can uh, you can actually get like a bit more meaningful um, output. So let's raise a new branch. 
let's um, get this. Let's also just to be just to be safe. Let's uh, we don't need to run this uh, all the other checks. So we'll for some like we'll for temporary thing move them and uh, let's add those as well and. Um, Yeah, we should, we should have our code in place. Let's also raise the pull request against our, um, our branch and against our repository. So this will do, this will do a few things and um, it runs your regular CI, your regular checks, right? So we can get in here and we'll see we'll see how long it's going to take so yeah it, it does like it does few all, all the basic things that you would typically do when you run um when you run your code so that's really that's really it everything passed so there's really nothing that tflint caught let's add Another thing, let's add, for example, um, let's add Chekhov, which is also a popular tool for the security specific reviews. We'll need, we'll need another job for this. So let's, uh, let's just, let's just copy it. Let's call it Chekhov. And um, I think I think we need to update permissions a bit. We need to be able to read repository. We need to be able to write the security events, and we need to be able to read our action results. So we still need to download the repository, which we will do, and then we need to install. Chekhov, and we also need to provide it with a few parameters. So um, we want to output to both CLI and SARI format. SARI format is a unified format for that um, like will essentially GitHub consume and it will properly display with different security things annotations stuff like that so that's um, and many tools work with this format so it's a really good thing to have and i think we need to upload the results now as well so we upload results in any case and we get the same file that we just added. So we run, uh, we, we commit these changes. Amazing. And um, let's see what do we get. So few jobs running, obviously like TFLint will not find anything because we didn't change anything in the code. And we'll see what Chekhov does and we'll, we'll look at the results. Okay, so um, we could improve a few things like download the external modules and stuff but it checks like it checks a few things especially for the kubernetes cluster so we can just we can just get the idea of what's going on and um, 
Yep. It it failed the it failed the check, and let's see why it failed them. So it did like it did get quite a few things. It got like um, Kubernetes specific stuff. It get like uh, mostly really the Kubernetes specific stuff. Let's see if we can look at the at the results a bit better. So. here the annotations yeah so uh, here they are in your actions and in the annotations so we got like 10 errors two warnings um like we should use the commit hash with metadata some other stuff on that view on that view on the error view can you make the font a little bit bigger um let's see let's see um yeah 150 150 should do okay yep. so it, it got like quite a few things mostly related to security we could enhance it a bit better so it will catch like misconfigurations uh, from the security side on the modules which is which is perfect and uh, one thing like tools like that they like as you can see right they don't they don't really address the code readability so let's look at the code a bit, like a bit better. So it's in the Terraform, and um, let's just go through the main. Yeah, let's just go through the main. So one one of the first things that can come to your mind when you review this code, as as a DevOps uh, professional. Um, you'll see that, okay, so you're creating a Google container cluster. You name it my cluster, which is evident that it's the cluster. Um, another, another thing is, so that's, that's good that you put the depends on in the end, so you can really, like, you can quickly locate the explicit dependencies for your code. Um, let's see. If we go to memory store, we have the dashes in the name of the Terraform resource. We don't care about this name really because that's up to the cloud, but um, like having dashes in the name is something that will like long-term affect readability because like snake, snake case is the standard. Another, another thing is like count is like in the middle of the code, which is pretty confusing because you would typically put it in the like at the top of the resource as well as for each. Um, other like this, the same here, and um, let's say let's go to the outputs. Outputs typically allow us to see what resources we are accessing, right? Um, outputs are like an API design. So we, like, by designing what outputs we want to expose, we actually need to be pretty mindful about naming conventions so others who consume our, our outputs, they actually can understand what resources they are accessing. Right? And um, this one just might be like the name is self-evident, but it's like doesn't really tell me what resource I'm accessing because I can have multiple clusters in the code. And as the consumer of the module, I don't understand the internals or like consumer of the of the remote state. So things like that. Um, other things like that's good that we have the providers in the separate file because like other source with many put providers all over the place so you don't really understand all of the dependencies that your Terraform project has. And um, if we look at the variables, for example, so typically you would put the description first and you would always have a description, no matter how obvious the name of your variable is, you would always want to have a description as well as the type 
because like being explicit here as much as possible is amazing thing because you understand like um you in half a year will forget what this what this whole thing is all about so it's vital to have the descriptions in place so there are like and as, as you can see things like that um they, they obviously like matter more let's say in half a year than today when you write them and um, they really like stand out when you have a large code base here we have a pretty small project and still there are a lot of things that could be improved so let's actually see how it would be possible with our github app so you can just go to the website, which is www.lasdoors.com. We go to GitHub. Let's install this application. We select um, repositories. Let's say, let's just select this one. So we access really only your code uh, metadata, which is mandatory by GitHub. And we have read and write access to your checks and pull requests. So we react on your pull requests and we produce checks as the result, as, uh, like as the result. And we don't ever execute your code. We get access to it only when the pull request is raised. So that's, um, that's important to, uh, to understand. And we, we don't store it, we don't execute it. We just, uh, um, we just process it and forget about it. So let's, install so that's pretty much the only thing that you should do let's get to the repository settings so we have this installed there is nothing really to configure um, let's actually see what we can like what other things we can add that would trigger our um, our app and um, it will trigger for anything pull request related but just for the sake of it let's let's add some like a piece of terraform which is going to be environment variable just do environment and that will be used as a prefix to all cloud resources. And we want it to be string. And let's also add some validation. So we want it to be, So it's going to be like too lower, if I'm not mistaken. I think it's lower. So yeah. And um, yeah, we, we want it to be lowercase. And uh, let's try and add it as a prefix to this. As well as to the memory uh, memory store redis so we've got like some small terraform changes uh, that would like, allow us to be a bit like, that would make us our terraform a bit more like, environment friendly let's push this so at environment specific Uh, 
Okay. So let's go and see um, what's going on. So we immediately, immediately called this and um, that review is not heavy. Like the, the review for the best practices is not heavy, so it's going to be like blazingly fast. And we also differentiate between the code that you affect in your current pull request versus the code that you have in your repository. Because you might have like a monorepo where you specify all your environments, um, all your modules, everything, and you don't want to check them and affect your pull request every single time. So we actually, um, yeah, we basically split those two reviews. They provide what's called like a neutral check. They don't really block your pull requests and nothing. They just uh, say that, hey, you're good to go, um, no matter what. So let, let's look at what we've actually done. Let's look at the PR specific review. We found like 17 potential things that we can improve. So if we go through the files that we change uh, through, let's say main TF, right? One of the one of the first things is like my, my cluster, as I said before, right? It's not really the best name because really you don't want to repeat what's written here because it's evident. You will always reference it through this resource. So like there is a ton of other names that are um, better. For example, like this, which is the default that you should go with. Um, another thing that uh, like Redis card is also, um, because it's a single resource, there, we just create one Redis instance. This might be a good idea. Like some other names also good, but don't mention Redis in here because it's self-evident. For each must be really like and count. They must be first in the resource definition if you do this. You know, like, this doesn't really like so we check things that don't really affect the logic that much, but rather increase the code readability. That's kind of what I'm trying to show here. And uh, like other things like snake snake case, right? We don't want to see dashes in the Terraform resource names. We would want to name it this if it's a single resource. And um, we want to place variable attributes in the very specific order because that's this way it's easy to read through them. Otherwise, it's all over the place. Like you want to start with a description. You always want to put an explicit type. And then you go with like default, sensitive, nullable, and validation in the end. Um, so we've got like, because we've got a bunch of variables in here, we've got a bunch of those. And um, other thing, like, and other thing, it also shows you the checks for the files that were not changed in this pull request. So for everything in your repository. And here we have like some Terraform in the .github folder, which is fun. Uh, probably for the CI purposes, we still want to have some housekeeping. So, for example, here it says that in the main TF, it has the provider specified. So you would typically want to have everything related to your providers in a separate file. This way you would have um, no problem understanding what your dependencies are essentially. So without actually running the code, so it will shorten the time for you to understand what's going on. And uh, other things like, so we have the, again, the names of the resources are all over the place. And there are other things like, let's say if we have multiple resources that are essentially like just copy paste just copy paste and there are like a bunch of them like four or more let's say this google project i am member um does it like instead of actually specifying all of those because it will be 
just wasting space and like mental capacity to read through this whole thing you would typically want to have it in the for each something like that and just a single resource definition and you loop through and you create a loop to create multiple resources so we identify things like that so we say that hey combine it into into for each statement and um like even if you have especially if you have the same things over here so um another big part is for example here depends on right it must be in the end so here is the example of how the resource um, attributes should be placed so depends on and life cycle they must be the very last attributes that and blocks that you add to your resources because that's th this way you are not actually when you're reading through a ton of attributes you're not missing them and um, again like outputs maybe some variables so th things like that that's that's essentially um th that's essentially the things that we catch so let's try and update the code base to reflect what we like um what we found out throughout the review and again we don't have to address all of them or any of them might be we are pressed might be like we already have the cluster created so if we change the name it will disrupt everything so we don't really want to like recreate resources unless we really have to so it's not like something that you have to um like it's not something that you really have to implement it's more of the hey if you do this your code will look better and you will understand it better so let's let's go through first of all um main tf let's name it like, let's name it this then we also have my cluster in a few places so let's let's update it here as well um, if you have like some terraform specific uh, plugins in your vs code or whatever like jetbrains does this like, really great uh, you can actually like easily navigate through things so we we've updated your we've updated our um, like the cluster let's also let's also update the redis we, we want to have it like we don't want any um any dashes we want it to be we want it to be this this and this as well so in the output right we want to first of all put the normal resource references and we want to make sure that whatever we are exposing, like first of all, the reference is this instead of my cluster. And now we need to update the output name to actually match what we're exposing. So the the name like should be like this container cluster location. And it will be this location cluster name so providers are all good and variables yeah let's just let's just update the arguments positioning so everything is consistent Perfect. Um, and I guess that's really, so it's this, oh, and apply deployment, good, wait conditions, good, right? Because there are like just a few null resources, even yeah. though everything is same. So, uh, Alex yeah. says, uh, uh, 
if I'm saying the name right, Lowell is, uh, thinks you might have missed one of the Redis dash carts in memorystore.tf. A little might bit be. of programming. Oh, that's, that's the name of the resource in Google Cloud. We don't really care about that much. Gotcha. Um, but that's, yeah, that's, that's a good catch. So it's not like, I mean, it's something that you might want to update, especially like if you, if you already created something and the, and you mm -hmm. replace the resource name, it will recreate the resource so inevitably. So you kind of like, you might as well update the name, but it's not like really something that you have to do. Mm -hmm. So um, let's go to the findings one more time. I think we addressed them all. So probably one of the things like, and we will not touch the GitHub um, dot, like, CI specific Terraform, let's say, because we really, let's say, don't care about it that much. So let's do some this push and if we go back to our pull request right it's sort of immediately almost immediately like in a few seconds available that hey um we still have a few a few things to go through in our code and there are like still others that we want to pay attention to. So let's let's look at what we missed. I think, oh, customization update for each outputs, like you don't name things output TF, everyone names it outputs.tf, but that's kind of like not, not a big deal. And Google, Um, okay, I guess that's, uh, yeah, like I think, I think really maybe like the snake case is something we want to fix. So a customization update, let's do it this way. And, uh, Okay, great. So we essentially just pushed and it already like updated a few things. So we don't, let's say we don't really care about the uh, like the other potential five because they are all potential, right? We don't really block your pull, uh, your pull request. Our, review with this let's say uh, like mostly linters and security tools they're aimed to block because that's what they are designed for and we are as a companion enable you to perform your code reviews better so let's merge this just for just so it's all it's all done and that's really that's really it. That's how would you, how you would work with our tool. And um, let me then do one last slide, and we can jump straight to the Q and A. Just give me a right. second. So let's see. And we should have the slideshow on. Right. So. Really, because we're in a public beta, uh, like feel free to visit visit the website, install the install the rep or this application into your repositories, both private and public. For the for the period of public beta, is free of charge. So uh, we'll post well in advance when it's going to end, so you can so you have time to adjust and see whether you need it. And um, the GA specific like GA version essentially will. In addition to Terraform, 
that we just opened for the public beta. It will also cover Helm, GitHub Actions, Docker files, and uh, some called specific Terraform best practices, like, uh, let's say, uh, in Google, in Google specific case, when you create a database, you want to make sure that you add some salt to the name because the database name is going to be reserved for a while after you delete it. And if you just playing around with your code, you will end up like renaming things with weird names and stuff. So um, things like that for Google specific scenarios, for AWS and Azure specific scenarios will be covered. And that's, um, that's really it. So I think we can jump straight into the Q&A. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, no, thanks. Uh, thanks, Alex. Yeah, the, the chat's open. There's a regular chat. There's a Q&A chat. You can put a question in sections uh, that you want. I'll read them out uh, for Alex and for the recording. Uh, just to <clears throat> kind of summarize, to make sure I got it placed, uh, you know, the last DevOps tool placed in, in, in my mind correctly. So, uh, People who are adopting the cloud, they also tend to adopt uh, well, cloud or Kubernetes. Uh, they also adopt doing infrastructure as code uh, and analyzing those that infrastructure as code. Uh, there's tools out there uh, like TF Lint for Terraform form linting. They're security tools, but none of the tools out there are are giving you an idea of how human readable is this Terraform or how human readable is this uh, uh, Helm chart. Uh, so the, uh, the tool that you've built has, uh, will review the, the Terraform or the, the Helm chart and, and just narrow down on, uh, you know, different naming conventions or things that, uh, that a human would have to pick up before and now, uh, now the last last DevOps tooling can find that uh, for us instead. That's that's exactly right. So you can think about this as, uh, for example, like what Sonar Cloud or Sonar Cube does for your regular application code, right? In addition to some of the security aspects and uh, like whether your test coverage is fine, right? It checks whether things sort of are readable, whether whether they make sense. So that's that's kind of like that's specifically what we are focused on because like tf lint is pretty much the standard for terraform workflows like tfsec check of mm -hmm. tools like that they are the standard we are not there to replace them but what we are the, what we are here to do is to make sure that you make your code readable and you don't spend a ton of time doing that mm -hmm. Nice. Uh, in order to to use it, I know you have the you know the the beta is in in GitHub. Uh, do I have to have my uh, my code in GitHub, or are there other? So it's GitHub uh, specific, okay. right? Uh, like the aim for the beta was to actually make sure you don't have to do any settings, so you just like pop it in and that's it. Mm -hmm. um, we'll see if it makes sense to make it like a, G a GitLab specific version or like some something that you can do in the self-hosted environment. Mm -hmm. But the idea is so you don't really have to, like you don't have to configure any pipelines for it. You don't have to configure any tokens, install something from a third party or register in a third party. Everything mm -hmm. goes through GitHub and it's uh, like, what was like three or four clicks installation. Yeah, it was all set up, uh, just a few clicks. Do you have some questions coming in from uh, the chat? I'll just uh, read them all out. Looks like the question mm -hmm. might be uh, kind of continuation. So for organizations just starting with uh, infrastructure as code uh, in CM, what would you suggest as the most critical first steps to ensure best practices are followed. So if you could just like have something good practice in place right at the beginning, what do you, what are the, some of the most critical things to make sure that that's there? So, and then, and then a follow-up 
what would you also consider as P1 to P5 things to look for as a guide to accepting or declining uh, pull requests? Okay, so uh, answering the first question, so well, if we like, if we nail this down to one thing, single thing, uh, one single thing would be making sure that you have consistent naming and uh, across all your variables and outputs. Just so, especially like if the organiz if let's say an organization adopts uh, IAC, you have uh, and you have like a ton of resources. You will you will inevitably write a ton of infrastructure code, and it will evolve over time for sure. Like you will learn more things, you will see what makes sense, what doesn't make sense, and uh, being able to have the consistent naming conventions for your variables and um, outputs right from the beginning is probably one of the most crucial steps because if you decide to update something in two years, that would not follow. That, that would be sort of out of convention and uh, something you just uh, kept because you already created things. It will like it will take a lot of time and a lot of energy to actually get rid of uh, these small things, but they will inevitably affect um, code maintainability. So naming conventions, like making sure you have all your descriptions, all your types in place, uh, validations where it's where it makes sense and uh, that, that sort of thing. That would be like the number one thing. And uh, like as for sort of P1, P5, so um, in, our, in our app, we decided to sort of made it like this way. Whatever is marked as failure in the checks is something you can update right now and it will not affect the state. So like naming convention for your, uh, for your uh, like, like not, not exactly like the naming convention, but so the resource of like the attributes placement, for example, that you have your depends on in the variant of the resource block that you have count in the beginning. So th things like that, uh, that would be like really the thing that you can fix right away and it will, it will affect, it will not affect your, uh, your output in any way. And then there are things that would like things that are marked as warning will either require resource recreation or will like or will affect the state outputs so these things uh they would like you would likely keep them uh, for a while and update later unless you just create a new code for the first time so that that's why we also do um, PR specific checks as well as the repository specific checks. So you always have like right near with you what's what's going on with your repository as a whole. Does it does it make sense? No, I appreciate that. So I was thinking through on the some other not on the infrastructure as code side, but on uh See on Java code, you want to migrate from Java 8 to Java 11. There's an open source project called uh, Open Rewrite where there can be recipes to, to port things. I don't know, I, I'm still trying to, to grasp the, you know, uh, the, the, the Terraform and how you're doing the checks, but is there, do you see any future of not just Hey, flagging these, uh, flagging the checks, but also providing a pull request to what, you know, uh, what uh, the the item might get named to. Um, we we might we might. I think that's uh, like that will ultimately depend on, like if uh, if the users will actually act on those, mm -hmm. because if like if there are some things that you like, that you can act. Mm, like act on and you do like we will like for sure automate those for you but uh, like if uh, let's say for example th that's that's why we split like failures and warnings mm -hmm. for this for this purpose so uh, we might automate failures we will not like automate warnings 
um, we like we already provide some of the suggestions. So like we, we provide some uh, let's say like some examples what uh, what would be a, a good code, what would be a bad code. So that's uh, that that would ultimately be your guide uh, for um, for updating stuff. For example, with so it's Terraform specific right now, and that, that's the public beta is. But um, let's say with Docker files, it's a bit simpler. Uh, so we will automate a bunch of things with Docker files, and uh, especially like what I found out throughout the years that with Docker files, like you just create them once and you almost never touch them, mm. which is a good thing, right? Mm -hmm. But you want to make sure that uh, whichever like whatever you wrote. Like it's optimal, it makes sense. Uh, for example, one of the blog posts uh, I've written on the uh, Docker file size, right? uh, like if it starts affecting your startup time and your scaling, meaning like uh, if it takes more time to download your Docker image than it is to start it, uh, might be it's a good idea to reduce the size, right? Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, like the storage is pretty cheap. Traffic is almost like zero, especially if, like for ingress, for sure. So there is not that much benefit from paying attention to it. Um, so yeah, we'll automate some things, things that are a bit more like kind of like resource recreation type of thing. We will not do because it's it can be destructive, and especially in the Terraform world, it would mm -hmm. be like um, from the Java world. And from the programming world, like database migrations, mm -hmm. it will be like, hey, we'll automate rewriting your database migrations to make sure everything's cool. Like, yeah. that's a pretty good idea, right? Because no one likes to do that, but it's a pretty distractive thing. Yeah, exactly. Uh, as you guys are thinking of maybe more questions for, for Alex, I do have, I always have a non technical question for all our presenters, for all our speakers. And it's in case we have you know some early career people uh, on the call. Uh, so you're you know seasoned uh, technologists. Uh, you've been through the been through the ropes and through the you know, uh, all types of different technologies. Knowing what you know now, is there advice that you would career advice that you would give to a younger person, uh, someone that's you know in college or just early career? Um, you know, just anything that you found found helpful or, or think would uh, be helpful for someone just coming up? Yeah, um, I think like the good idea is to learn the basics. And I mean, like if we're if we talking about the programming world, uh, we're talking about like pat design patterns, um, like code best practices, unit tests, uh, th things like that. If we're talking about the cloud world, uh, we're talking about uh, with Terraform. We're, we're talking about the like usage of modules, so you don't write every single resource yourself. So l learning the basics of the like how you, how you write uh, how you write your code and how you because you inevitably if you are in the in the AT in any way uh, you're writing code in the end of the day. So that's um, that that would be like the number one thing, and probably like just to throw the number two thing. Um, it would be to actually practice a lot because one other thing we do with um, like courses specifically, and that's why like it's taking so much time to do them correctly, is um, we want courses the way we the way we do them. We want to make sure that it's the only course that you ever need on that subject because instead of like just going through the documentation and finding out, hey, that's how you write your Docker file. No, like you don't get experience like that. You, tip, you need to write Docker files a lot to make sure that you understand everything. And by doing so, you will inevitably face issues. Like you will see the broken output, you will see the broken builds all the single, like all the time. And um, so going through those ropes is essential. It's like that. That's really what's in the end of the day differentiates you from the person that just read through uh, through the documentation or use like ChatGPT or like Copilot to generate the code for you. That that's really where the difference is. So I think like 
stick to the basics and like hit the wall as many times as it takes. No, that's uh, that's great. So it's a little bit for people that are into sports. It sounds like kind of a sports analogy, you know, uh, or a sports analogy it kind of plays in there. Learn the uh, basics, practice the basics. Uh, you may have watched some film on how somebody else does does something, but in order for you to get good at doing it, you just have to do it and put yourself into different situations where you're doing it and having to solve uh, solve problems and learn it that way. Yeah, yeah. It's like a marathon, right? If you're into running, like you don't just get and run the marathon. Like, I mean, you might, but you'll probably like then lay down for, for two weeks and be useless but like if you if you want to do it right you will have you will have to put the mileage on like there is no way around that and that's uh that's essentially what this is all about and i did hear uh, you know because uh, i know we're today we're looking at uh at this tool to look through our uh our terraform suggest ways to make it more human readable but when you're answering the, the the career question, did it? Uh, my background listing made me think that uh, last DevOps team is building some training and some coursework on some uh, on some tech fundamentals. Is, did I hear that right? Uh, that's that's right. That's right. We'll probably release like by the end of the year, I think, um, like the course on containers basics, and uh, that will cover like. Um, not only like the very basic things on how to create a container, but the idea is to make sure you understand how to apply those in the context, meaning like we'll, we'll cover, let's say like Node.js plus GitHub actions, how containers in this case work together. Then like Python and AWS, how to, like how containers in AWS work with Python, like Go and, G, and, and GCP. And, th and things like that. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll cover like a bunch of technologies and uh, we'll put them like into into a specific context. That's that's kind of where the most important thing is. And it will be probably like, available by the end of the by the end of the year. On my LinkedIn page, there is like a post featured that uh, has the uh, early signups for the course as well as the on the website you can find the, you can find the early signups um, it's a simple google form we will not spam you it, it will be like we'll, we'll just send a coupon when the when the course is online uh, that you can get a pretty substantial discount for it all right cool so i'm not seeing any uh, other questions in the chat so alex really appreciate uh, you taking the time to uh, not just build the tool, but show, take the time to come and, and show it to us here at GDG, GDG Cloud Southlake. Uh, thank you, everybody that joined for taking time out of your day to uh, try and learn something new. What's happening? Uh, what's happening out there? Uh, so thank you uh, so much. Yep. Appreciate it.